Welcome to part two of this deep dive into the best, worst and weirdest alien knockoffs, send-ups and shakedowns. We've already seen what the 80s had to offer, so we should know what lies ahead, but hopefully there'll be a few surprises. <laughs> and because it feels wrong when we don't, we begin in Italy, where exploitationeer Al Pizzeri had just seen James Cameron's Piranha 2 Flying Killers and come to the conclusion it wasn't nearly stupid enough. In Creatures from the Abyss, a group of teens decide to have a party in a dinghy, but in addition to forgetting food, drink and music, they overlook compass, life jackets and clothes. So when it goes dark, they're screwed. What if there's a storm, Dorothy? Storms don't happen during the summer. Fortunately, or not, they come upon an abandoned yacht and despite it having a dead body floating on the doorstep, decide to break in and make themselves at home. I was just thinking. That man we saw in the water, could he have been one of the crew? He could have been the owner of these shoes. It transpires the yacht houses a fish-based genetic research lab that's been altering DNA with radioactive plankton. Plankton? What's that? And that proves to be the only excuse Pizzeri needed to do whatever the hell he wanted, which included depicting the most disturbing life cycle imaginable, beginning with an impregnation I can hardly show and ending with a birth nobody needs to see. My baby! Oh, oh, Christ! Mommy loves you! Mommy loves you! My baby! Despite a familiar setup, this isn't a knockoff by any means, but the focus on forced impregnation and reproduction thematically bond the movie to Alien. And, more importantly, give me an excuse to begin with a classic rather than a turkey, even if the characters belong in a slasher. What kind of animals are these? They're horny ones! Come on, will you drop this shit? I wanna go get laid! It was Pizzeri's first film as director, but somehow not his last, because he went on to make Mummy Theme Park. Shit! The mummy's out of the tomb! How the hell did it do that? At least I think he did. I may have imagined it. Naturally, he's since retired to focus on conducting his animatronic animal orchestra. And that's a shame, because Creatures from the Abyss is an incredibly entertaining bad movie. One of those Italian-made, US-shot, tone-deaf oddities full of amateur actors failing to marry mood to subject. Hey, check out that unit. This is strange. Something's going oh, on. Look, aquatic bonsai. Oh. Whoa, terrific! Monkeying about with DNA was in vogue in the 90s, and that made laboratories a common setting. Five miles down, Alien Terminator works like one of those underwater movies from 1989, which means we don't really know why anybody's down there, or why they wait until the day before home time to piss off the monster that kills them all. <laughs> It fails to deliver anything we might reasonably expect of an exploitation movie, except maybe Grot, and only manages that by reusing footage from the previous year's Midnight Tease. I guess Maria Ford makes for an entertaining scientist, but there's a reason I introduced a ringer to avoid starting on this thing. Don't even start with me, Taylor. I'll kick your ass. Oh, you think I can't? <laughs> Tell you what, prove it. Mind Ripper offers only a very small step in the right direction and is written by Wes Craven's son Jonathan, who conceived a super soldier with a horned penis in his mouth, set him loose in a secret lab and left a bunch of alleged characters to deal with the consequences. Okay, we're feeding him sterols. Sterols? He needs sterols. That's why he took Frank's brains. It's an unfocused mess, with Lance Henriksen coming and going as the lead, other characters being built up only to be killed off, and a fatally unimaginative monster. Where the hell is Frank? For most of the movie, it just looks like an extra from a bodacious music video. And for some reason, it only goes after adults, even though the kids are more plentiful and deserving of death. Is there anything that doesn't make you horny? My mother's douche. 
These first movies remind us there was a trend for applying genetic jiggery-pokery to alien imitations even before Alien Resurrection legitimised the idea in 1997. You're a thing, a construct, they grew you in a lab. Somehow it's a natural fit, and although the phenomenon speared off in different directions, there've always been DNA-blending movies with ridiculous effects and alien-y aspects. Suck on this, bitch. In the 90s, Alien also became a magnet for franchises interested in giving up, and that led to a plethora of supernatural genre antagonists being dumped in space and made to get their xenomorph on. For the Critters and the Leprechaun franchises, it took four entries to develop from their initial matching tales of an intellectually disabled adult farm worker preying on a naive young bumpkin child into improbably space-based alien soft parody. And it isn't the finest hour for either. Critters 4 was shot back to back with its predecessor but feels cheaper and takes a bizarre approach to casting, making the worst actor in the series the star and adding two of the best actors to appear in a third sequel to anything in thankless minor roles. We still get paid. Leprechaun 4 also attracted some top new talent of a kind in the form of Guy Siner, who may be familiar to British viewers for playing Gruber the Gay Nazi in classic sitcom LOLO. Are you one of them? <laughs> Really, it, it was very lonely on the Russian front. <laughs> Australian filmmaker Brian Trenchard-Smith presumably knew the show because Sine is playing a similar character, or at least another camp German, and he's the one ray of sunshine in an otherwise cloudy movie. I know what you were doing. You are a naughty, naughty boy. Actually, that's not fair. This is a horrible film, but there are highlights. Tim Colcheri channels Arlie Ermey as Sergeant Metalhead Hooker. I'm busy. What the f*** do you want? And he's great. It's another example of strategic casting, as the actor was originally signed to play Ermi's career-making role in Full Metal Jacket. What the hell are you doing here, lady? You're in the wrong place at the wrong time! But best and worst highlight of all is the nod to Alien's preoccupation with life cycles. My video looking at 1980s Alien knockoffs features two movies in which fully grown men are reborn, and one in which a fully grown monster is unborn, but this takes the cake with a fully grown leprechaun being reborn in a manner I've never quite understood, and I'm more than happy for it to stay that way. Let that be a lesson to you, lad. Always wear a prophylactic. <laughs> the fact that has two meanings is terrifying. To be honest, I've forgotten why Leprechaun 4 isn't in the Aliens video, but it does give me the chance to plug Aliens Expanded, the new documentary from the producers of In Search of Darkness. We're all pretty excited. If you become a backer via the link in the description below, you'll receive a bunch of cool stuff, enjoy a series of special events, and help support this channel. Really, really cool. Another sequel drawn in probably into deep space is Project Shadow Chaser 3, which is a thing despite evil android Romulus previously falling from a helicopter and exploding at the end of two Die Hard knockoffs. Not only is he still functional, but he's now a soul-sucking Russian shapeshifter too. crashes a big spaceship into a large spaceship with near unbelievable precision, then launches into a disappointing take on the alien routine. There are strong individual moments, but nothing to string them together, and the aliens-inspired characters are bland. Gee, there's so much testosterone in the room, you girls could get pregnant just breathing in. Don't worry, Dee, he didn't mean you. Up yours! But they're not up to supporting a full hour of character development before the killing starts, and it gets boring, despite more imaginative casting that sees Sam Bottoms hitting rock bottom, Christopher Neem being as unconvincing as he always is, what a wanker. and Aubrey Morris from A Clockwork Orange showing up. Hi, 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 Mr. Deltoid. Funny surprise seeing you here. Somebody somewhere must have Mr. Deltoid transforming into Frank Zagarino on their B-movie bingo card. I hope to God it'll torture you to madness. And then there's this big dumb bastard. With 
Jason captured and held at a maximum security research facility, the government's finally noticed his immortality makes him the greatest scientific discovery of the modern age. And David Cronenberg wants to understand how it could help mankind. His unique ability to regenerate lost and damaged tissue, I mean, it just it cries out for more research. Is that the most or least stupid idea in a Friday the 13th movie? Yes. Actually, it can't be the most stupid, because that happens when Jason breaks free, kills everyone, and gets cryogenically frozen for half a millennium without anyone in authority noticing. They killed nearly 200 people and simply disappeared without a trace. I don't like to nitpick this kind of plot point, but I can't work it out. Either the government forgot about the maximum security research facility housing dozens of officials and the greatest scientific discovery of the modern age. Who cares? Or just decided to write it off without investigation when the staff all disappeared. Who gives a shit? Either way, I want to know who's still paying the electricity bill when these geniuses turn up 500 years later. Anyone thinking what I'm thinking? Open it up. Jason's thawed out on a spaceship full of people we're required to hate, and once he's up and about, the payoffs are a funny, gory wonder. Even for a slasher, the proximity of comedy and violence is extreme, the only jokes in the movie coming immediately before or after murder. Besides, we found Condor. What's his condition? He's screwed. Jason X writer Todd Farmers talked of the influence the Alien franchise had on the movie, although like most knockoffs of the era, it has a very different tone to Scott's film. Hey, you want a beer? Or do you want to smoke some pot? Or we can have premarital sex. <laughs> we love premarital sex. I thought this was an alien sim. Yeah, it is. But we can tap back into that realistic, claustrophobic aesthetic and sense of dread with Dark Side of the Moon. I'm losing my mind. Oh yes, to me, and I will take what is mine. It's 2022 and a maintenance ship stranded on the dark side of the moon encounters a space shuttle lost 30 years earlier in the Bermuda Triangle. Why the Bermuda Triangle? I can't imagine, but that's only part of the story because the big news is Satan's on board. Let him that hath understanding count the number of my name. Dark Side of the Moon doesn't get everything right by any means, but in asking what would the crew of the Nostromo have done if the Xenomorph had turned out to be Beelzebub, it poses a fairly ambitious question and actually offers a reasonable answer. I've had just about enough of your insanity. The crew were a thoughtful bunch that includes Joe Turkle making his final screen appearance as engineer Paxton Warner, for which he was made to wear his Elden Tyrell glasses from Blade Runner, and Camilla Moore, who attracts the Dark One's attention despite being an android. Get away from me, you mother... Their controlled performances, the writer's preference for tension over carnage, and the director's patience mean that although this thing might sound like the more extreme Event Horizon, it feels like an episode of The Twilight Zone. Or well, that one movie, Alien. Will you cut it out with this sci-fi bullshit? Within the Rock retains that understated realism and lack of schlock, but creates a more Xeno-like monster for space miners to find buried on a moon hurtling towards Earth. Their job is to save the world Armageddon style, but it transpires the moon's core is essentially the Phantom Zone, and it's home to an ancient imprisoned monster. Director Gary Tunnicliffe's a makeup effects artist by trade and has a strong history in horror, having overseen Tony Todd's appearance in Candyman and supervised makeup on dozens of notable genre movies. That experience comes through in the detail poured into his monster, but he's also good with the cast, which is headed by a cracking Xander Berkeley in one of his classic Am I Evil or Just an Ass roles. Like everyone else, his character seems to be based on Aliens resident social militants Parker and Brett, because there's a lot of this kind of talk. Once again, your blue collar worker gets a shit. That's just the way of the world, I guess. They expect us to save it for free. StarQuest winds the schluck down even further, with producer Roger Corman apparently being in experimental mood. Not with regard to the VFX he chose to reuse, obviously, but with the tone, which is calm and downbeat due to our cast waking from hypersleep to learn of Earth's destruction. Leave it to the human race. It turns into a mystery and isn't very alien, but it is fairly interesting, unlike the follow-up, which covers similar ground without the twist. Naturally, we get model shots from Corman's previous movies, and I can't tell you how exciting it is to see this one flipped. But there's more than typical stock footage, because the movie also imports a whole character in the form of Lizardman Cayman from Battle Beyond the Stars. Do not fire upon our vessel! 
It wouldn't matter if it didn't take screen time away from Jerry Trimble. I don't give a shit what you believe, preacher man. These languid, claustrophobic mysteries use aliens' vibe and environment to stage a more passive and supposedly cerebral crisis. But as in the 80s, Fred Olin Ray specialised in the flip side of that coin by using Aliens Monster to stage games of cat and mouse in small town middle America, which may not be a confined environment, but is a free one and comes with easy access to cheap motel rooms. Biohazard Alien Force owes a particular debt to Alien thanks to a monster with a parasitic life cycle. The action's fairly contained in a Florida suburb, and one thing Fred Olin Ray movies have taught us is that small-town America's bursting with colorful locals. Remember that jellyfish monster came through here about 30 years ago? Scariest thing I ever did see. Except maybe that Indian death curse. Gators went nuts. Snakes. Even had sharks in the Everglades. While down in the Sunshine State, Ray's team also knocked out Dark Universe with Joe Estevez as a proto Elon Musk whose toy spaceship crashes a Xeno Watts it into the Florida swamplands, where he sends a team to investigate. I don't like this at all. Now, do you believe in vampires, Tom? It transpires the ship's captain's been genetically reprogrammed by alien spores that have turned him into a monster. Once on the ground, he begins hunting brunette women, but that's not the interesting part, because he's initially played by channel favourite Steve Barquette. You know, it's getting pretty cold up here. I'm beginning to be worried there's something wrong with the life support systems. What the hell was that? Here he was only cameoing for Buddy's director Steve Latshaw and producers Fred Olin Ray and Jim Wynorski. But he's the star of, and auteur behind, the superb Empire of the Dark, which I featured in a video on Vanity Projects. Unfortunately, he passed away recently, so it's good to be able to mention him. I want you to know that here on planet Earth, there's, there's thousands of... No, Steve. There are millions, millions of people down here that are pulling for you. Based on these movies, it seems you can retain the feel of Alien without an alien, as in StarQuest, but you lose it the moment the movie's environment's opened up, which may seem perverse, but does add up. How? The tension's dissipated when characters are able to just leave, whether they choose to or not, and a technical environment, like a spaceship or underwater lab, will contribute unique challenges and opportunities. On the other hand, and as I think we're beginning to see, small-town America will contribute incoherent backwater cliches, which isn't to be taken lightly. Cyrus, you ever hear anything like that? Well, maybe the time Billie Jean backed into one of them electrical disturbances and got her butt burned. <laughs> <laughs>Normally I'd use this as a cue to get into the themes and tropes that define Alien and its knockoffs, but I did that in the 80s video. So I'll just mention that at its core, Alien's a game of cat and mouse conducted in a confined technological environment by a small group of people and a monster. Ideally, the people are blue collar trucker types, the monster a shiny black biped, and the movie's themes should be related to reproduction and motherhood, or perhaps corporate greed. What? If we strip away the window dressing, that setup's shared by a number of the era's genre classics. Not only Aliens, but also The Thing and Predator, each of which initiated their own counterfeit subgenres. You've gotta be f***ing kidding. That can make it hard to identify a single mother movie, but on the whole, Aliens imitations should address the same things as Alien, only with well-trained space marines rather than wage slave every people. They should be sent to investigate a disappearance rather than stumbling on a relic, and they should take place in an isolated but fairly sprawling environment rather than a claustrophobic one. You guys know what this is, right? Ugh, not this again. It's aliens! Knockoffs of the thing should identify themselves with a monster that can imitate humans and strong themes of isolation, paranoia, and facial hair. This ground's been frozen for the last 10,000 years. We have no idea what's coming out of it. While knockoffs of Predator just need to take place in a jungle that gets mown down or blown up. Predator isn't the most nuanced action movie, and that tends to be reflected in its imitations. Of course, knockoffs of those movies can and do cross-breed when left to their own devices, with hybrids of Predator and Alien being particularly common. 
It makes sense given the compatibility of their worlds and audiences, which led to the franchises being formally linked by comic books, novels, and terrible movies. Get to the chopper! You don't have to do this, Dallas. But these combo cash-ins don't usually rip off Alien vs. Predator, and instead rip off Alien and Predator, which means blending movies rather than pitching them against each other, as in forgotten Mark Dacascas vehicle DNA. <laughs> Unseen Evil is another typical example of this, its metaphysical protector of Native American artifacts being a xenomorph variation capable of shimmery invisibility. The Presence takes a different approach with a middle act based on Predator and a third act on Alien. In both, the Ripley's played by Kathy Ireland's swimwear modeling Shakespeare enthusiast. I gotta get out of this business, Maria. It's turning my brain to mush. But these are pretty vanilla takes on the idea of a pralian, and by now we should know they aren't all that way. <laughs> Ghanaian filmmaker Samuel K. in Cancer's three-hour epic 2016 is mostly people sitting about talking. But they're occasionally interrupted by this chap, who's leading an invasion of Earth by throwing stuff about and doing karate on random locals. I covered this in my Terminator video because it also features a T-101. But I'm not talking about pralians without bringing it up again, and then putting it straight back down because it's almost unwatchable. <laughs> the Thing is the next most popular candidate for hybridization and introduced an aspect of icy paranoia to crossovers like Deep Freeze, an entertainingly dumb clunker about a telepathic woodlouse, not, as it might appear, a killer grizzly bear and a resentful seaman. I saw him nosing around in a science lab. I think he was after that hot uh, college broad. Oh, great. He's getting a piece of trim and I'm down that shithole freezing my ass off. Uh, curse of a working man, my friend. I'll tell you one thing, that was no f***ing bear. What do you mean? Of course it was. Blood Predator throws as a dummy with its title, but there's no mistaking the influence of The Thing on this wonky fiasco about a small group of people trapped on a mountain that can't decide whether or not to be snow covered. Perhaps because it was clearly over 100 degrees during filming. Not that the cast appeared to spend much time on location. Come on, Sandy. Let's go home. Ever since this trend really kicked off in the 90s, Alien or Aliens has been paired with just about every major genre property of the last half century. They found a way to bring back dinosaurs. Right. And I'm Bigfoot and she's a Loch Ness Monster. There are too many to mention them all, but a couple, like Stephen Norrington's Robocop hybrid, are good, bad or absurd enough to warrant a closer look. From the hands of a madman, an unstoppable weapon has been unleashed. Norrington's early effects work included the facehugger and animatronic chestburster featured in Aliens, but he made his reputation as a director with the much-loved Blade then ruined it with the much derided League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But before either, he'd stumbled on a happy middle ground with Death Machine. Late breaking news flash just in. There is a psycho death bot on the loose. Brad Dorif works for corporate behemoth Chank as just the kind of evil genius Wayland yutani probably had lurking in the basement. And he's built a Xenobot to terrorize a group of executives and humanist protesters who want to blow up the company HQ. We're the good guys. As well as Robocop and a little Terminator, I'll be back. there's a strong sense of Richard Stanley's hardware with the films being visually as well as thematically on the same page. And it's no surprise to find Norrington worked on hardware's own killer robot. In fact, Stanley and Norrington have a lot in common, both being eccentric English genre filmmakers whose interesting low-budget killer robot movies earned them a shot at the big time, only for them to blow it so spectacularly it all but ended their careers. I bet they're friends. What the hell is this? Can Oprah Winfrey? Virus is another alien crossover with a scary mech theme, and it's surprisingly strong stuff for a studio movie. Steve. The antagonistic alien controlling the nightmarish robots is an electronic life form that's beamed down from the Mir space station and taken over a Russian naval ship. 
building a variety of robots to threaten a cast led by Jamie Lee Curtis and a salty Donald Sutherland. No one else is going to claim salvage on this vessel but us. Vampires? So what the hell is a vampire? It's sort of like a man, only far more evil if you can imagine that. No prizes for guessing what writer-director Daryl Root chose to cross with Alien in Dracula 3000. Pin the pit! When Captain Caspar Van Helsing and his entirely believable crew come across a Transylvanian derelict loaded with dead bodies and mysterious coffins, they find themselves fighting for their lives against Nosferatu himself. Or, more often, vampire Coolio, because Root seems to think he's funny. The high I get from being a vampire is even better than where I got to go with that Comptonian weed we got in. Comptonian, asshole! That's the least of the filmmaker's crimes, though, because he's so committed to badly lit close-ups, his movie's almost unwatchable. In a way, it's a shame, because it's weirdly superficially faithful to Bram Stoker's original novel, which offers a depth of ideas that could have elevated a movie like this above its contemporaries if anyone knew what they were doing. What's going on? I don't know. Ultimately, it was never going to be any good, but it could at least have been likeable. Coolio sees to that, though. Aurora, baby. It's so nice to see you. Did I ever tell you how many times I see you and want to ejaculate all over your bazonkas? Thanks to James Cameron's The Abyss, aquatic Phalian crossovers of the late 80s were confined to the bottom of the ocean, while in the 2000s they were attracted to oil rigs, presumably due to increasing ecological concerns. Welcome to the food chain. Oh, great. Parasites are typically implausible example with its detachment of paramilitary janitors dispatched to a secret oil rig in order to test a covert cleaning product, because that's how these things work. But to complicate matters, environmentalist commandos are incoming, some kind of underwater beastie is already on board, and there are clues that the cleaning agent itself could pose a danger. At this stage of development, you'd have to be insane to test it in the field. My copy's terrible quality, they tried to light everything with torches, and half the characters seem to be played by the same Geordie Tim Roth. Didn't you read the instructions? Instructions? What are you talking about? So it can be hard to keep track of who's who, where and why until a Ripley emerges from the murk, by which point I guarantee you won't care. A few weeks later, Jim Wynorski's infinitely more entertaining The Thing Below debuted on US TV, and unusually for the Prince of Poor Taste, he seems to have had something approaching a budget to play with. Or at least he started out with a budget to play with, because at one point there was money to buy in footage from Virus. But based on the computer-generated editions, the cash seems to have run out before the movie did. Billy Warlock's an oceanic delivery driver making a drop-off at a secretive offshore drilling platform, and he really should have paid more attention to the foreshadowing, because the clues are all there. We'll get your precious cargo to Maryland, or die trying, whichever comes first. The storm's been upgraded to a level five. They're calling it one of the worst in decades. That thing is churning out enough radiation that it could tan an elephant at 100 yards. So there's internal strife, a terrible storm, and a highly dangerous radioactive science in Majiggy. I hope everything will be okay. The monster's capable of creating telepathic illusions, a result of Wynorski having access to a western set he didn't want to waste. But murders committed in anything other than the creature's tentacled form are a waste of our time because the CGI is incredible. Wynorski was often away to his next movie by the time the VFX were delivered, and claims he was left incandescent when he saw them. I'm sure he was, but in my experience, effects are as good as a movie can afford, not as good as 3D artists and compositors can achieve. Not necessarily. And all concerned with the thing below went on to thriving careers on major productions, while Jim went on to make four sequels to the Bear Wench Project. I didn't let anyone get close. On the contrary, Mel, you did. 
As you'd expect, the whole movie's shot through with his trademark feminism. He even managed to find a role among the largely male cast for a struggling young stripper. And of course, he doesn't miss an opportunity to remind us women always know best in his movies. I'll get it. You can't open the door! Yes, I can! No! Another film bristling with amusing CGI is Careers Sector 7, which gives Ripley and the rest of the cast motorcycles to ride about on. I can't help but wonder why anyone would need or even be allowed a motorcycle on an oil rig, other than to outrun monsters, but this is one of those movies it's best not to question. The rig's the only one of these things shot entirely on a genuine drilling platform, which I'm guessing wasn't really operated by the Wayland Corporation. But because they hardly go outside, it may as well have been a warehouse. That I can forgive, the rest I can't. Oh. The kills are kind of shocking, but only because they come out of nowhere. The rig doesn't work like other movies by building tension or establishing things. Instead, filmmaker Peter Atencio just lobs hand grenades through the window every now and then to make us jump. The 80s brought a handful of straight-to-video OVA alien clones from Japan, and in the 90s that trend was continued by Alien from the Darkness, which features an interesting conceit involving a female beast disguised as a human trying to find a way to mate and reproduce among the all-female crew of a deep space transport ship. The subtext is handled with subtlety, maybe the English translation's just vague. But this appears to be an early example of Yuri, or lesbian-themed anime. If it is, it's well disguised as generic Japanese monster schlock. <laughs> Speaking of explorations of female sexual orientation conducted within the framework of animated alien cash-ins... I keep those on if you want to live. Ridley. Alien resistance fighter. If you grew up with proper Scooby-Doo and haven't seen the new versions, Velma's now gay, Daphne's a vapid TikToker, and Fred's a horny moron. Fred! Which leads to a surprisingly funny running joke in which nobody takes him seriously and he doesn't notice he can remove his helmet. We need to patch and seal our air tanks. Gonna need two welding rigs. Make it three. Like I said. Two. I'm about as much the target audience for this as I am Yuri, so it may not be fair to judge, but as a concept it feels stretched and weird. Be sure to capture my perfect physique. It's full of references the typical child's never going to get because instead of striking a tone that works for both adults and kids, like the original cartoons, the two demographics are catered to independently with the movie alternating between pratfalls and nudge-nudge references. I know what you're thinking. Ridley, she's just some whacked out alien freak who's seen one too many sci-fi movies. Yes, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Me too. Unlike Alien itself, it is at least appropriate for kids, though. Main hatch glow! Quick, shut the airlock! The alien's locked out now! Alien. Action figure. New from Kenner. Largely forgotten today is the way Ridley Scott's film was often seen as the new Star Wars when first released, leading to some early matinees being packed out with families. Are you sorry you brought him? Yes, <laughs> I am. Not all parents thought it was inappropriate, though, some firmly believing the film featured an important message for their young ones. Are you sorry, sir, that you brought your son along to see Alien? No, ma'am, I think you should have seen it. It's something that he needs to know that things could like that could happen in life. That could be a true story. Would you recommend to your little friends who are your age to go see it? Uh, no, I wouldn't. As a postmodern parody, Scooby-Doo in Moon Monster Madness wants us to think of Alien, as did most of the early knockoffs, which basically sold themselves on their purported similarity or connection to it. But once a mother movie reaches a certain age, a new kind of imitation tends to emerge. Determined films made by grown-ups with ambition, money, and the hope we won't notice, they're ultimately just remaking a classic. It's behind you! 
A good example is 2017's Life, which looks and feels different, but underneath is just alien taken to the extreme. The realism's near absolute, the environment's the most claustrophobic yet, and not only are we part of the creature's life cycle, we're complicit in it. After voluntarily reviving an alien at a cellular level, and then nurturing it with science. This is some reanimator shit. Oh, that's a very obscure reference. No, for a nerd. Not if you're a nerd. Most of these modern takes tend to go heavier on the horror though, with Event Horizon's alien Hellraiser hybrid a kind of template for numerous haunted or supernatural spaceship movies. I want off this ship. You can't leave. She won't let you. More on that in the Aliens video, but for now there's Supernova, an art house crossover with echoes of Dead Calm that was ostensibly directed by Alien producer Walter Hill, who came on board on the proviso he'd be able to rewrite the script to calm things down and create a little distance to his earlier film, then stormed off in a huff because production was a monumental shit show. We're leaving. Original lead Vincent D'Onofrio quit early, replacement James Spader claimed it's the only movie he regrets making, and Francis Ford Coppola, who was brought in to bring the project home, joined Hill in walking out and demanding his name be removed from the credits. My greatest fear is to make a really shitty, embarrassing, pompous film on an important subject. Before he left, he contributed the film's strangest detail when he created a sex scene with Angela Bassett's character by reusing footage of co-star Robin Tunney. Bassett had refused to strip, so he digitally coloured Tunney's skin in an outtake and cut around her recognisable features. What I have to admit is that I don't know what I'm doing. It's still not as ignominious as appearing in Critters 4, though. Cool it. At one point, Supernova was planned to be Alien meets Hellraiser, but Pandorum does a better job of combining the two, although amusingly it may have drawn on Roger Corman's StarQuest as well, because its plot about spacefarers waking to learn of Earth's destruction, which tips them into a murderous psychosis, is exactly the same. But Pandorum has more biker space zombies. All three of the modern prestige movies I've just mentioned revolve around mankind being apocalypsed, a theme that seems to underpin this genre in the digital age, and is definitely reflected in its low-budget, low-concept offerings. So if 30 years passed on Earth? Everybody on Earth is dead. Look on the bright side, though. They're serving pancakes today. The deluge of geezer teaser misdemeanours with which Bruce Willis marked the end of his career is probably best forgotten. Often shot in a couple of weeks with the man himself on set for only a couple of days, they represent the worst kind of modern movie exploitation. Those who toy with my magical horseshoe must endure my wrath. One of the worst kinds of modern movie exploitation. In my video on Die Hard clones, I defend a deadlock up to a point because Bruce is on screen throughout and actually appears alongside other actors. But Breach tops even that because he's in almost every scene and perhaps controversially, I'm calling it a real movie. You gotta be kidding me. Willis plays Clay Young, a former captain in the kind of military that can bust you down to janitor for insubordination. But he's taken the demotion quite well. One of the lucky few to earn a place maintaining an arc on its voyage to New Earth, it's fortunate he's on hand when a space worm brain warps half the crew and they go full Kanye, evolving into the kind of demented zombies that can only be taken out with plug-in visual effects and cheesy one-liners. Who wants barbecue? It isn't any good, but it's in another league to its brethren, although that appears to be a minority opinion. Willis is undeniably more engaged than usual though, everything's relative, and despite him obviously not being 100%, the character has lots to do and plenty to say for once. Amazing, we leave 19 billion behind, but this space Nazi, he gets to see. Other actors are left to do the heavy lifting with Cody Kearsley taking the majority of the responsibility as a stowaway named Noah. I'm uh, Noah. Let me guess, you are the dead man walking knocked up my unmarried daughter and made her drop out of West Point. And Thomas Jane pops up in a glorious extended cameo as the ship's gung-ho commander. All right, there's no need to complicate things. Let's kill them all. But this is just about a real Bruce Willis movie. Just get the fuck out of my seat. Perhaps the last we'll ever see, and that must mean something. I'll take a lot more than aliens to kill me. <laughs> Stranded is much more icky and oozy thanks to writer-director Roger Christian's interest in life cycles, which he may have picked up while art designing on Alien. What if something used Ava to reproduce itself? 
It's all the result of an alien spore invading a moon base constructed from delightful little models we should take a moment to appreciate. I don't know why they're so unconvincing, but I'm not sure Christian gave this project his all, which I resent because he's the only reason I brought it up. The man won an Academy Award for set decorating Star Wars, but here he has everyone speaking into folding book lights that were meant to pretend are radios. This is Moonbase Ark, Colonel Brockman to Mission Control. Come in! As Stranded proves, there aren't all that many worthwhile modern alien knockoffs, but this Russian oddball could elicit a smile. We are going to have a baby. Why? Project Gemini was presumably made for Western audiences because not only is it dubbed, but the cast seemed to have been speaking phonetic English. At least that's my assumption based on their lips being in sync. We need to get to the airlocks. And that's where the Trojan is. It's only that dubbing that makes it funny. Intriguingly, if it was subtitled, the experience of watching it would be entirely different. One person put multiple lives in danger. He almost destroyed humanity's only chance of survival. That's who you should be crying for. I think that'll do it for now. There are, of course, a near infinite number of modern low budget takes that might qualify as alien knockoffs, but as ever, I'm not going to bother with the boring ones without good reason. I think that's a very good idea. And besides, there's still the third and final video in the series to go, and modern aliens knockoffs seem to be even more numerous and ridiculous than their alien equivalents. If one of those monsters happened to get here, and all this bullshit that you think is so important, we'll only be able to use to wipe your ass. That will be enough. Taking a close look at a classic blockbuster's imitations like this is a good way to get a feel for who and what made the original film so special in the first place. Some are what they are essentially as a result of individual genius. For some, it comes down to canny reinterpretation and even cannier delegation. And for others, it's basically just blind luck and good casting. Shocking. But Alien's a great example of film's collaboration because it was driven by different people at different stages of production, and at least half a dozen of those people were irreplaceable. Without Dan O'Bannon's core idea, Ron Chusette's forced impregnation and chest burst, David Guiler's double agent, Walter Hill's faith, H.R. Giger's monster, or of course Ridley Scott's overarching vision and determination, there's no Alien as we know it. And that's before we even think about Sigourney Weaver's performance, Jerry Goldsmith's music, and so on. They were all crucial to making Alien Alien, and although imitators have spent over 40 years stealing their ideas, it's in the balancing and execution of those ideas that Alien comes alive. Yeah. Right. Cut it. Cut, Cut it. it. Save the blood. On paper, it's a fairly thin film, not that different to It the Terror from Beyond Space. And while thin films might seem easier to imitate, whatever magic it is that makes them transcend their simplicity will almost always get lost in translation. Perhaps the Marines so popular in Aliens knockoffs will have an easier time with their big action set pieces. I don't know why I said that, because I can confirm they do not. Remember to check out the link in the description and consider backing incoming documentary Aliens Expanded. You'll enjoy countless perks and benefits amid the sheer delight of helping to support this channel.